All right. So this um, this is like a property of strongly typed languages, which we say C++ is a strictly typed language, is a strongly typed language. But this level of how strict a type system is varies. You, if you're comparing different programming languages, they have this level of strictness, right? And even though Golang or C++, they are both strict, uh, not dynamic languages, they have a strict typing system and the variables are kind of of strict type. In terms of nil or in terms of nothingness, there is no type system for that. Whereas in Haskell, you do. So in Haskell, like if you're representing kind of the lack of value as maybes, then the compiler keep helping you of even distinguishing uh, what those things are. Another interesting thing is that if I have, so we have A, which is uh, nothing, but it's, uh, so if I ask what is type of A, it, it says it's maybe int. And then we have B, which is also nothing. And if I ask what type is B, it says it's maybe string. And then we have C, which is also uh, maybe string. So if I have C, which is just Mariusz, and I compare is B the same as C, the compiler says no, because B is nothing and C has a value, which is Mariusz, right? So if I, if I, if I say D is just Mariusz as well, and I compare D with C, it says, yeah, they are the same. Like, you know, just Marius is just Marius. The value is the same. I, I have this uh, referential transparency. I cannot have two values which have the same value and, and being different, right? So it says, yeah, they are kind of exactly the same. Um, but if I say, okay, I have E now, which is of type um, maybe, maybe something. I don't specify what type E is, right? So I say E is nothing uh, because I didn't specify the value, right? So E is nothing. I have a null pointer, but I didn't specify what E is yet. It's a maybe A, right? And then I compare it. Can I compare it with A? Uh, remember A is maybe int. So if I compare A and E, will the compiler complain? No, the compiler will not complain because um, this A in this comparison becomes an int, right? So if I'm doing this line uh, and E is kind of generic, uh, my E nothingness is of a generic type. I haven't specified a concrete type for my nothingness for E. It's a generic type A, it can be anything. And in this line, it became an int. So this E is maybe int. And if I do it with B and compare it with E, again, it says, yeah, they are both nothing. They are both null pointers. Uh, but in this line, E is maybe string. So I have a polymorphism in such a way that I can specify things in a generic way and they become concrete when I'm using them. Uh, it's the same with polymorphism of generic types in C++. If I have you know, a generic function which types type t and I call it with an int, then it becomes kind of a generic function which is specialized for int. It, it happens here as well. So I can be very specific and then compiler will kind of complain if I'm messing up the types or I can be generic in which case the compiler will allow me to do this polymorphism things and allow me this flexibility, right? Um, so Suzanne is asking if you um, if you can stack maybes. So you can stack maybes, but then they become may maybes of maybes, right? So I can have a which is um, just just of nothing, uh, and then. I can specify what the outer maybe is for and what the inner maybe is for and what the nothing is for. So here I have three levels. I have a value inside, the, like in the very, very core, I have some value of some type. It could be, let's say maybe int. And this maybe int is inside a maybe, maybe int. And this maybe is inside maybe, maybe, maybe int, right? So you can kind of nest them, yes. Um, and then uh, Yoav is asking, are uh, there any advantages of uh, typing null, like recognizing null? And the answer is 
Of course. So what are the advantages of having a type system in the first place? Uh, the advantages are that if I have two variables, A and B, uh, and they are of different type, the compiler keeps track of what type they are. And if I'm doing something illegal with those types, the compiler complains, right? Um, so in Python, you know, if you have A and B, there, there is no compiler to care about your A and B type. You know, initially A can be a number and then B can be a string. Um, and then B becomes a number. And then the compiler says, well, yeah, whatever, I don't care. I mean, you do whatever you want, right? And the compiler doesn't help you. So you have a lot of runtime bugs because the compiler didn't pick something that a type system picks up on the compile stage. And it's the same with nils. So if I have nil values everywhere, the C compiler doesn't care. I mean, nil is a, just a nil. And then, you know, it, it just like, if you're passing null values around, the compiler doesn't catch any type errors because it's just nil. And the, the nils are kind of polymorphic. Like they, they, they the compiler doesn't care. Whereas here, uh, if you have nothingness and the nothingness is of different type that it should be, the compiler will complain and you will catch possible runtime errors earlier because the compiler kind of catches it, right? Um, all right, so let me quit that for now. Um, I will make it a little bit bigger. Let's clear it and let's, let's move on. So we have a um, couple of slides. Uh, we have to go through some theory. Uh, the theory is a little bit heavy, but I, I try to keep it to the minimum. Uh, and those who are interested, you can read um, the book chapter from, from the book. Um, I did, I have to tell you that um, I have been learning Haskell for the last maybe three years, kind of more actively. I, I knew some functional programming patterns from before, uh, but the kind of the active learning of Haskell was probably the last three years. I'm, I'm not full time on it. So like on and off, right? Sometimes I do a bit more, sometimes I do a bit less. Uh, and you know, this kind of a Dunning-Kruger effect. So there is this um, Dunning-Kruger effect where when you start learning something, you're kind of climbing this, uh, this uh, curve uh, and then you're getting kind of to, to a point where you think you know everything. Uh, and then as you keep learning something, your confidence kind of drops down and you get to this kind of a value of despair, right? So there is this, uh, at some point you, you think you've been learning something and you get to a point that you say, I don't know anything about it anymore. Like I, I thought I knew it, like I thought I knew C++, but the more I'm learning about it, it's like, man, it's so complicated and, and so on, right? So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of like, um, I'm some, somewhere here in, in Haskell, right? So now I kind of appreciate what I don't know uh, about Haskell such that um, I know what else I have to learn. Uh, so it's the same with everything. Like when you're learning something and you, you, you meet someone who says they know everything, they probably are here. They probably know a little bit and they have a very high confidence but they haven't really become the guru yet. Uh, you know, to become a guru, you need to spend a lot of, a long, long, long time. Um, so I was sort of uh, somewhere around here, like a, a year ago in Haskell and said, yeah, let's do this Haskell course. And the more I'm studying Haskell, I'm kind of dropping down. I'm kind of around the value of despair now. So um, it's kind of uh, <laughs> interesting, but I really enjoy it. Like I, I really kind of appreciate uh, the, uh, the depth that Haskell offers, uh, which didn't occur to me before. Anyway, um, let's um, start with some simple math definitions because they become a little bit useful. Unfortunately, in functional programming and in Haskell, they use a lot of vocabulary, which is um, derived from um, math, not from programming itself. So you have kind of a two schools of approaching programming. One is purely from mathematics, and this is the kind of the line that Haskell was taking. And one is from assembly languages and machine operators, which has, of course, it has to do with math as well. I mean, you know, we have the NAND gates to program, so it's a Boolean logic anyway at the bottom, uh, but it has kind of a slightly different uh, history. And they kind of meet, so they, they kind of go to trying to solve these complexity problems and trying to make programming uh, deal with complexity in, in different ways, uh, but they have different kind of history and different language. 
Um, but you know, some terms are the same. So you know, binary and unary operation that should be pretty straightforward, right? Binary takes two arguments, unary takes one argument, ternary takes three arguments, right? So those are kind of a simple terms, all right? So as a quick quiz uh, to to check your knowledge about the previous slide, uh, I'm using the uh, the functions from Haskell, which are wrapped in a in, in a uh, round brackets, right? So what is this one? It's a plus operator, uh, very simple. Perfect. A plus operator is a binary operator because it takes two arguments. It takes A plus B, right? So it's not a unary because plus takes two things. All right, let's try next one. The next one is plus plus. I will, you know, give you a hint. It's the same as concatenation in, in strings. So that should be pretty straightforward. All right, so kind of a varied opinions here. <laughs> so uh, plus plus also takes two arguments. It takes the left hand side to what you want to concatenate stuff to and the right hand side, right? So if I go to GHCI, and I say Marius plus plus space and dot, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna concatenate Marius with space n, and I'm gonna get a single string. And the same is with, um, you know, that was just a syntactic sugar. If I have one, two, and concatenate it with um, three, then I'm gonna get a list of one, two, three, right? So it, it's a binary operator. It takes left-hand side and right-hand side. All right, it, uh, let's do a next one. Okay. So this one is multiply by 100. This is a function. And how many arguments this function takes? Perfect, doing better. It's a unary function, right? So if I ask, what is the type of multiply? It says, well, uh, multiply takes one argument, second argument, and gives me a, 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 an out, output. And both of those types have to be numerical types. But if I ask what is a multiply by 100, it says, well, it's a function from a number to a number. It just takes one argument and gives you a number, right? Which is fine because if I do multiply by 100, you know, multiply five by 100, I'm gonna get 500, unary, perfect. All right, next one. The next one is tricky. There are some functions in Haskell which are super counterintuitive for imperative programmers. <laughs> and you need to stare at them for a while and kind of get used to them. This is one of those functions. It's a comma comma function. So is it unary, binary or ternary? All right, so those who said ternary got it right. Uh, that was almost correct if it was a single comma you would get it right. So let's let's check it out. So what is the type of a function which has a single comma? Well, the function which takes single comma takes two things. There is no restriction on type. It just takes any two things, A and B, and makes a pair out of them, right? So if I call a comma on one and two, I'm gonna get a pair of one and two. Right, so let's check what are the two commas. Well, two commas are the same, it's just that they take three arguments. One, A, B, C, and then they join them by 
kind of a triplet, right? So now if I say two commas and I pass it three arguments, I'm gonna get a triplet of one to three. Um, the triplet can be of any type. So I can say Marius, right? As a last element of the triplet and it will work. It's not like a list. The list needs to have uniform elements. The um, tuples, uh, they can have arbitrary elements. That's why we don't have any type restriction on what A, B, C are. They can be of the same type, they can be of different types. So a two comma function takes um, three arguments, but I can partially apply it, right? So I can, um, I can call three comma, uh, two comma function, which is th uh, three tuple triplet with two arguments. And then what I'm gonna get back I'm gonna get back a function which only takes one argument, right? So if I say I want f and f is applying two commas to one two, I'm gonna get a function which now takes a single argument. So now f is a unary function. And this unary function, if I give it Marius, so let's say I give it Marius, then it's gonna generate a triplet which has one two and Marius as a, as a last element, right? Uh, and if I give it Bob, the last element will be Bob. But the first two are already bound because I have a partial application here. All right, so that was a bit tricky. Let's see how you guys doing. All right, so Sebastian is uh, leading the pack. No, no con contest there. And then we have uh, a bit of a staircase. So, all right, let's, let's continue. So we've learned about binary functions, unary functions and uh, t tertiary fun fun functions or functions that take three elements. You can continue, right? There are functions which take four elements, five elements and so on. But now let's focus on a binary functions only. So binary functions can have certain properties. And one of those properties is associativity. So associative binary function is a function which doesn't matter where you put the brackets, right? So if I have a binary function which takes two arguments and I have x, this binary function with y, binary function with z, it doesn't matter if I do this first or if I do this first, right? So um, I can do x with y and then the result of that with z or I can do y with z first and then the result of that with x. And if the function with this binary function op, which I called op here, uh, has this property, we call it associative binary operation or binary function, okay? Uh, we sometimes write it without this operator or sometimes we do the dot operator uh, in math. So we demonstrate how they are composed. Uh, but you know, the idea is that I can do x with y and then with z or I do y with z and then with, with x. Simple, right? Um, there is, this is important. So remember that one. Um, there is um, um, one more, there is one more uh, operator which um, is called uh, commutative. And that means that the operation doesn't matter in which order you apply the arguments, right? So the operation, um, if I have the binary operation x with y, it's the same as y with x. But the associative uh, property doesn't require the commutative property, right? So if I have this, I don't need to have the other one and vice versa, right? So those two are distinct properties of binary functions. Um, that, that one typically come along with some of the examples that we're gonna use, but keep in mind that it's not necessary, right? Um, so for example, um, the uh, concatenation, right? So if I have uh, world and hello, right? Uh, I have A and B uh, and hello. And if I do plus plus with word hello, I'm gonna get a different thing that I'm gonna get with hello world, right? But uh, if I do those three things, Right, so I have hello world, hello and exclamation mark. It doesn't matter if I do this first and then concatenate it with this, or if I do this first 
and concatenated with this, right? Does it make sense? So concatenation is associative because it doesn't matter if I do the AB first or BC first, but it's not commutative, right? If I turn the arguments around, you know, this is not the same as hello world, right? Um, those two are to produce different things. I cannot swap the arguments, right? So um, yeah, ma make that distinction, but um, there is one more, the identity element. And the identity element is a simple concept that a given operation with the identity element gives whatever was initially first, right? So if I have this particular binary operation and there is an identity element. If X is with this identity element, then it's always X. This identity element doesn't change anything, right? So, um, okay, so, so we have two concepts here important. One is binary operation. Second one is associativity. And third one is identity element. So if you have those three elements together, you have a monoid, right? So monoid is basically a structure, a set, that has associative binary operation, which I can do on the elements of that set. And that set has an identity element. So you, you may say, yeah, what it has to do with programming. And it's like, yeah, wait a minute, okay? Wait three years, you will see, okay? But right now, uh, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to uh, go through. So if, if you ask for information about, for example, what is a function in Haskell, right? So I'm asking, okay, Haskell, tell me what is a function application in Haskell, right? And Haskell says, whoa, it's a semi-group, it's a monoid, it's a monad, it's a functor, and it's applicative. And it's like, what the hell are those things, right? Um, so we kind of going through those terms. We, we kind of get to the monoid and we basically say, yeah, monoid is just kind of a set, is a domain which has kind of two properties. It has an associative binary operation, which can be done on, the, on that set, and it has an identity element, right? And that's what monoid is. So there is no big like mystery here. It's kind of just an abstract mathematical class of sets um, with, with, with those two things in, okay? So let's uh, refresh what we've learned so far, right? So we're gonna spend this week learning a little bit about those uh, four things, about monoid, monads, functors, and applicatives. Um, a semi-group is kind of like a monoid, but it doesn't have to have an identity, okay? So, um, so semi-groups also has an associative binary operation on a given set, but it doesn't need to have an identity. If it has an identity, then it becomes a monoid, right? So you see that a semi-group is also a function application, uh, but it's not, um, um, yeah, it's kind of a weaker form of a monoid because it doesn't have to have an identity. So uh, again, if I ask uh, Haskell, okay, Haskell, tell me about maybe, what maybe is. And, you know, maybe tells me, well, it is uh, also a semi-group, it is also a monad, it's also a functor, and it's also an applicative. And it has other classes like show, which we know converts stuff to strings, uh, can be read from a string, and also has foldable and traversable. We will talk a little bit about those two uh, after we do the monads. Uh, and then once you have those terminology, then you sort of understand a little bit more the type system of Haskell and how things kind of work. It's not, you don't need to learn a lot about uh, category theory or any of that to, to use it effectively, but it kind of helps to just have a basic intuition about those terms. So a basic intuition about monoid is, well, it is some sort of a set uh, that has identity and some associative op binary operation on that, right? All right, so let's refresh. Um, Let's refresh. Um, Marcus couldn't put the name on time, so I will wait a little bit more for people to put their names in. And we... Okay, so in this question, you can only mark one answer, uh, but they might be more than one correct answers. So just pick one, okay?
So I couldn't change it such that you could do multiple. Uh, you can only do one. So pick all associative binary operations from that set. So we have negation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Which binary operation is associative? Great. So negation is not a binary operation. Negation is a unary operation. It takes one argument. Okay. So it's not binary, it's unary. Uh, addition, perfect. Uh, it is an associative. It doesn't matter if we say A plus B plus C, if we do B plus C first and then plus A or other way around. And multiplication is also correct because we doesn't matter if we do, um, you know, 10 multiplied by 10 multiplied by 20. If we do the last element first and then multiply it by 10, or if we do those two first and multiply it by 10. With division uh, and subtraction, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, with subtraction, it kind of messes up because of the way the um, you know um, negation works. So if I if I if I do, um, it's a little bit counterintuitive. But if I do three minus two minus four, right? Um, let me see. If I do, um, yeah, that should work. So if I do three minus two first, then I have one and one minus four, that would be minus three, right? So if I do from left to right first, I have minus three. But then if I do two minus four first, I will have minus two. So I will have three minus minus two. And that is five, right? So subtraction is not associative because I cannot do the second two first and then the first one. I have to do them. I, I mean, I can do them whatever I want, whatever the brackets are, but the result will be different. The point is that the result is different, right? All right. So now you get kind of skilled in picking up what are the associative binary operations and um, what are the uh, let's see um, now you have to pick the monoids so you will have some sets with some operations and you have to say which one are the monoids again i think you can only pick one um, so you know set of all integers with plus strings with concatenation, set of all integers with multiplication, uh, Boolean values with end, and Boolean values with not. All right, so all of those are monoids uh, with the exception of the not operation because not is not a binary operation. Not is a unary operation, right? Remember monoids, you have to have binary operation, two elements. Not takes one element. All of those are monoids, perfect. So most of you did fantastic. Um, so let's do, let's move on. So the next one is, you have to type, what is the identity element on the set of integers with addition with plus? So we know a set of integers with plus is a monoid, but to be a monoid, it has to have the identity element. So what is the identity element for plus? So what something plus something always gives the first something. All right, so uh, there was a couple of correct answers. Um, so let's try it, right? So the idea is that whatever I put plus the identity element mu must give me the first thing, right? So whatever I put first 
uh, plus the identity needs to give me the first thing. So 10 plus zero, yes, gives me 10. 11 plus zero gives me 11. So 11 plus one obviously doesn't give me 11. It gives me 12. So one is not a good identity element because it messes up with whatever the first thing is, right? And remember, it has to be something like X plus this identity element needs to give me X. So the identity element for addition is zero. All right, so following that logic, what's the identity element for uh, multiplication? I think you're getting kind of a, a hang on it, hang of it. So that should be pretty straightforward. We should have more correct answers this time. Excellent, it is one. Uh, because the computer is marking it, uh, the computer will mark one uh, smiley face as a wrong answer. So that's a good lesson. Uh, remember that when you're doing in Sparrow exams, uh, try to think what the computer thinks and kind of try to do it the way the computer will mark you. Uh, we often go over the exam again uh, and we pick those things and we manually grade them uh, for to, to correct the mistake the computer is making. But you know, just to be on the safe side, uh, you know, do, do that. Yes, of course, uh, the identity element for multiplication is one uh, because whatever you multiply by one will give you the first thing anyway. All right, so uh, let's try a little bit harder things. This is not super hard, but it's a little bit harder. So what's the identity element for strings with the concatenation operation? Here you have to think a little bit outside of the box because um, it is kind of the same with lists. So strings, so identity element for set of strings or set of lists with concatenation. What is the identity element? We know it's a monoid, which means it has to have an identity element, uh, what it is. It's an empty string, perfect. So the identity element for concatenation is an empty string. So whatever I concatenate with an empty string, I'm gonna get the first thing, whatever that was. And the same with lists. If I concatenate a list with an empty list, I'm gonna get the original list, nothing changes. All right, so I can see we're making some progress. So let's try a really hard one. So, this one, this one is not hard if you're very familiar with Boolean functions, but if you haven't really heavily worked with them, you have to think about it and you have 30 seconds. So what's the identity element for the set of Boolean values with the end operation? I mean, you know, if you think about it, um, it's easy but you have to think. And if you think about it, it's, you know, it's a 50-50 chance. Like what is the set of all Boolean values? What is that set composed of? Well, it's composed of true and false. Like the set of all Booleans is just two elements, true and false, right? So one of them has to be the identity element because there, there are no other elements in the set. So I have a set of values, which is true and false, and I have a binary operation, which is end. So now if you're just guessing, you have 50% chance of guessing correctly, right? Um, the idea is if you, if you have, you know, X and this identity element, you're always gonna get X, right? So what is that? Uh, and for end, if I have this end operator, um, then if I put, false here, I'm gonna get always false, right? So I'm not gonna get X. So, you know, by by kind of logically analyzing it, if I put true here, it means I'm gonna get false if the X is false or true if X is true, which means I'm gonna get X at the end, right? So 
the true is the identity element and some of you got that perfectly right. And you got it perfectly right and you capitalize it using the Haskell notation, not like C++ or Golang notation, which is great because I had trouble like, what should I say? Should I say true small t or true capital T? And in Haskell it's capital T and you got it right. So I'm not sure if menti is a uh, case sensitive by the way. So, all right, perfect. Um, so let's check the leaderboard. If Sebastian is still number one, there has been some movements and yeah, we have Sebastian still number one, but we don't have the staircase anymore. We have a more of a gradual um, progression and yeah, um, I think you're doing fine. So let's move on. So what's the next thing? Uh, so we covered monoids, right? So we, we covered monoids. We're gonna skip monad for a, for a moment and we're gonna do functor. Functor is an easy one. Uh, so you already know functors. Um, so it like the, the monoid is some sort of category, some sort of type, uh, some sort of set. And then if you have two of those, and you can map from one to the other, then you have a functor. This kind of the ability to map from one to the other, right? So functor is a mapping between categories. Uh, so like all you need to remember about functors, it's kind of the mapping. So we will treat, you know, a functor as the mapping uh, done between, you know, a certain categories or a certain data structure, right? Um, Unfortunately, C++ also has a notion of a functor. And in C++, a functor is something that can have, um, so um, in, in, in the functional programming or in most programming languages, if you, when we're talking about the functor, we're talking about a, a data structure. So we have some data structure that can be applied a, fun, a function over, right? In C++, a functor is anything, a data structure or whatever that can be applied the round brackets over, right? So it becomes a function, right? <laughs> Which is a bit stupid. So don't confuse it with like, don't read about functors from a C++ um, context because it is wrong. Um, so in most things we just have kind of, um, uh, you know, a basic concept of a map over something. And if you know Java or if you know um, uh, many other languages, they have a concept of, you know, mapping a function over a collection, right? That's exactly what functors are. So this collection would be a functor because you can apply a function to it, right? So like in all, in most programming languages, if I have a list of some sort, I, you know, I, I have a list of three elements. Uh, and then I have ability to map a function over it. So I can map a, a, a unary function because the elements are single, single elements. So I now need a unary function. So I, for example, can multiply it by 100. Multiply by 100 is a unary function. So this list becomes, you know, 100, 200, 400. And this list is a functor uh, because I can map a function over it, right? Uh, what else can be a functor? Well, we know from maybe that maybe also is a functor. So if I have, um, if I have uh, just two and I have this um, multiply by 100 function, I can map this function over the functor and get a new functor, right? Uh, with the new value in it. Um, so um, I could say map, but because the map over list, like what I said here, is a kind of a special case. Uh, the generic case for functor is called F map. Like F probably stands for functor. So if I do F map, um, I'm gonna get, uh, let's see, I'm gonna get kind of the, the value, but multiplied by, by 100 because maybe is a functor and I can map a function over it and kind of modify the values inside. Same, same as I modify the values inside that list to get a new list, right? Um, so that's pretty straightforward. 
All right, so it works with lists uh, and in, in lists, um, lists are functors and then f map is the same as map. So I mean, the, the two calls, like if I do map, it, it does this, but if I call it f map, it does exactly the same thing. It's just an alias, right? Okay, so now we, we finish kind of a simple, simple things. So we know what monoids are, we know what functors are. Uh, now we have to talk a little bit about effects. And effects, it's a kind of a complex, um, complex hand wavy <laughs> topic. Um, so to, to make the discussion a little bit more concrete, we're gonna constrain ourselves to external and internal effects only, okay? So effects in programming, they like whatever you do in, in your program, it, it usually has some effects, right? And those effects can be local to your function. They can be local to, to the computation that you're doing, or they can be external. For example, you put something to a file system or you displayed something on the console, right? Uh, so those external effects are something that is outside of your program. And the internal effects are something that you still have inside your program itself, right? It's, I mean, it's complicated. Like you do need to get some intuitions, but you already have intuitions because you kind of already know what is an effect when you're doing up your program. Um, but to specify it very formally, it's a little bit tricky and people are arguing what effects kind of mean. And there is no real clear formal definition of like how we should deal with this. Uh, but, um, just distinguishing between external and internal effects is enough. Um, so two quick questions. Um, how many we have left? Yeah, we have four questions left. So two, two more questions about Haskell, um, just to refresh your understanding of Haskell itself. So Haskell allows imperative programming. So it has to do with the effects and it has to do with the way Haskell works. So in, in, in imperative programming, you can generate effects very easily. In pure functional programming languages, you cannot. So does Haskell allow imperative programming? And the typical answer is no. Everything in Haskell is pure and you cannot have kind of the imperative effects the same way as in imperative programming, but it kind of depends a little bit of what you mean by the, that question, right? So there, there might be some interpretations of this question where you could argue that Haskell allows you an imperative style, especially with syntactic sugar, but internally it doesn't. So that answer is not correct you could argue it depends how you interpret that, that it might lean towards that answer, but you have to make an argument. So that's why those two are correct, but this one is not. Uh, it's a little bit hand wavy, I, I admit. But one more question about Haskell. Can you have impure functions in Haskell? So it's a little bit different question now. So the previous question was a lot about uh, effects. And this question is you know, about purity of Haskell functions. Uh, and the answer is no, you cannot have impure functions in Haskell, right? I will come back to that. So keep, keep that in mind. The, the answer here, there is no, it depends. The answer is no. Um, one more. So now the, the answer logically follows, right? You should know the answer now. Uh, exactly. A Haskell is one giant single pure function called main, <laughs> right? So you, you've noticed like when you're doing the Haskell things, you, you kind of, at the end of the day, you're saying main equals, and you do, you know, you, you're doing some stuff, 
And that is just a single function, which is composed of some other functions, which are composed of some other functions. And it, it goes all the way to the, to the bottom. And that's it. That one giant function is pure, same as every other function in, uh, in Haskell. But then, then you say, yeah, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, you, I, I can do put string, right? I can do this, put string line. And that definitely has a kind of external effect. And that's not pure because, you know, if I, and now there's the question, like why, why this one is not pure? Why this one gives different um, output every time I call it? And they say, yeah, yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like I will do this, I will do, uh, I need Vim for that. So let's do this. Uh, so I will have main equals, and I will do this. I will get a name from the user, right? Um, and then I will put string line, uh, hello plus plus uh, name and that's not pure i mean every time you call main you're gonna get something else on the screen right um yes on the screen you're gonna get something else every time you call it but the function itself is still pure and we will learn like on thursday why uh it's a little bit too much to to do everything at once but um the answer is that main is still pure so th there is a bit of a magic of how Haskell manages the, the purity, right? Um, so let's check the scoreboards. Mm, yeah, some reshuffling here. Uh, the two top three, let's say, stay constant. Great, congratulations. Um, so, Haskell function is pure and it's a giant function which takes some, something as an input and produces the same output every single time, no matter how many times you call it. Whereas all other programming languages and like what we just saw in Haskell kind of look like this. Like you have some instructions, you have some functions and they mess up the internal state, they mess up the outside world and it happens from all over the place, right? That's how everything works, right? That's how C++, Golang, you know, assembly, all programming, imperative programming languages work like this. They have effects on the outside world. They have effects on the internal state and they do that from whatever place you want. Like in any function in Java or in C++, I can say print or C out, right? Uh, and I will have effect in the outside world. In Haskell, well, we've learned uh, by assumption that that's not the case. We always have a pure functions and main is a pure function, but so how, how, how this happens, right? And that is a very kind of curious thing. Like for many years, Haskell was like this. In Haskell, the main was, main was taking a string and was producing a string and it couldn't print anything outside on the screen and couldn't do any effects like any outside word effects at all, right? That's what Haskell was. Haskell was quite useless, but it was still useful for string to string processing. So it all, all it was doing was taking a string, doing all its pure function magic and spitting out a string. And if you give it the same string, it would always spit up the same, the same answer, right? Uh, it was pure by the very, you know, um, easy definition of purity. But now we see that Haskell can do this. Haskell can do outside world. So how, how could that happen? Like how could Haskell be pure and at the same time do outside world effects, right? It sort of is a bit of a puzzle. So let's leave this question mark here uh, and let's uh, go back to our functor. Uh, so all we're discussing here, all we're discussing this, this kind of um, um, monoids, functors, applicatives, and monads is to answer that question, like how that happens. Um, while we don't break the purity, why, you know, we want main to be pure, but we still want to have effects on the outside world. And how could we do that? Um, all right, so let's go back to the, to the F map. Um, so functor is something that takes 
a function, a binary function. We've learned binary, you know. Uh, um, no, no, a functor takes a unary function because a functor operates uh, like the function operates on a functor and the functor is a single value, right? So uh, a functor is something that can take a unary function applied to elements of, of some sort of structure and gives us back the new elements of like from one category to another category. So we have like one type A and then mapping to type B, right? So this mapping, this mapping is the, the functor, right? So a functor, again, um, allows a function to be applied to a structured value and then works between a normal function and the structured value. That's what we've seen like in uh, GHCI when I had this, uh, can I recall it? Yeah, I can recall it. So you see, I have a structured value, which is two, and I have a normal function, which is multiplied by, by 100, right? Uh, what will happen if I try to apply a uh, hundred multiply by hundred by um, into the, the non-structured value? Well, of course I can do that, but I don't need an F map. Like I don't need a functor to do that. Like it's just a normal thing. I can always apply a unary function to a normal value, right? Um, so the same I can do like um, with the world. So I can apply again a unary function, which is hello, um, with with the word. It depends on which side you can put the the argument of this partial application of the function, right? I can put it like this, or I can put it like this, right? So depending, this is a a, a binary operator. And this binary operator takes two values, but I'm making it a unary function by, by supplying one element. So depending on, on which side I do that, then I have a certain effect. Um, and the, uh, the concatenation happens. But if this is a structured value, and what we mean by structured value, it's kind of not just a value, but it has a value which carries some sort of effect with it, right? So a maybe string, maybe string is not just a string because I can have all the strings, but it can also be nil. It can also be nothing, right? So if I, if, if I, you know, think about it, like you have a set of strings, right? So you have a set of strings and in, in the set of strings, um, what can you have? Well, you have all possible strings, ASCII characters, and you can have an empty string, but in the set of strings, you don't have nothing. Like it, that, that concept is not a string itself. The concept of nothing is something outside of the set of all strings. The same with integer. Like you have zero, you have one, you have minus one, you have all possible integers, but the concept of nil, of nothingness, is not part of the set of all the values, right? So. If I have a maybe string, or if I have a maybe int, I have something extra apart from the value itself. I have this kind of additional, let's, you know, th this is where this hand wavy effect comes in, right? Um, so a, a maybe string is not the same as just the string because I can express additional context. I can express additional thing, right? So for example, if, I, if, if we have this uh, read maybe, right? Um, the read maybe carries a certain context with itself, right? Read maybe reads a value. So if I say uh, maybe string, right? Um, if I call this function, it will give me uh, a value string, but it can fail. It can give me nothing. And it's kind of different to just read. So a read function can only like a, a read string can only give me a string. So if the, the thing is from, from what I re I'm reading is not a string, I will have an exception. I will have a kind of an error that the program will blow up because the domain for this function is strings, right? So um, we have this um, concept of carrying uh, some effect with the value, 
by wrapping it in, into this kind of context, computational context. So, and, and maybe that's the kind of one of the simplest computational context that we can have because we can have some sort of a value of some type A plus this additional thing that whatever, uh, whatever we were doing with the value failed and now we have nil, we have this nothingness, right? Um, all right, so coming back to the functors, um, it, the functor allows us to apply a normal function to a structured value, right? And it works between a normal function and the structured value. And by structured value, we, we mean this sort of some value with some extra context, okay? And maybe it's one example of that. Um, so, okay, so what, we have two more questions. So let's, let's do this one. So when I do F map F on a list of 10 elements, what I will have to get back? That's right. So uh, the point here is that if I do like, uh, let, let's, um, I have this um, list of 10 elements, right? Uh, and I'm doing some, some map of F on that. But if, if I do this mapping, I always have to get a list of 10 items of some sort, right? It doesn't matter what F is, I'm always gonna get 10 items back. They can be strings, they can be numbers, they can be whatever type. It's a, you know, mapping between one type or, or another type. So this F, you know, F uh, can be uh, a function saying, um, I'm, I'm kind of converting it to, uh, to I, I don't for show, I don't need the lambda, I can just do show. So then I'm converting the numbers into strings, right? And I'm gonna get 10 items, but now they are strings, right? Uh, but I cannot get nine numbers and I cannot get 11 numbers. I'm always gonna get 10 numbers. So th this is to, um, to demonstrate that this F map F doesn't change the structure of this structured values, right? Um, it operates on them, it modifies them, it can change the type, change the value, but the structure itself is not touched, right? Uh, so one of the uh, things is maybe, so we have this kind of a normal value plus this additional state or this effect. And if I'm applying F map on the, on the, on the maybe, I'm not gonna change the maybe. Like the, uh, the maybe is all continues to be a maybe, right? So if I have a maybe int, um, so again, let's say A is um, just 10 and it's maybe int, right? Um, and if I do some f map of some any function on of f on a on, on my value a, uh, I'm not gonna change that. I, I, I will change the value, but I will not change the, the structure, right? The same with the list. Um, another one which carries a certain state is either. Um, so either is a, a, a very interesting type which has left and right side. Right, uh, and Rust is called uh, result. Um, by the way, in Rust, either is called result and maybe it's called option. And uh, Rust also uses this concept and it's quite nice for error handling and for, uh, for value handling and for getting rid of this nil checks or null pointer checks. Um, so either B, uh, if you, if I say, okay, my A is, um, uh, my A is right 10, okay? I have left and right value and left and right value can be of different type. And my right 10 um, is my kind of like, again, it's like um, I can force it to be either. So if, if I do this, um, then the right value becomes some sort of number. I didn't specify what type of number it is. So it will be polymorphic. Uh, Haskell could treat it as a float, could treat it as an int, could treat it as an integer, but I can kind of um, 
specified more concretely. And then the left side is not specified neither here if I say just write 10, but I can specify it. And usually we carry some sort of error in the left side or some sort of string which describes what went wrong, or whatever you want, right? So the left side can be whatever. And then the, uh, the right side in this case has to be a number or I can force it to be an int, right? Um, I, don't, I don't have to do it because I can keep it polymorphic. And you should get used to keeping things in Haskell polymorphic because that gives you a more, much more power. You become kind of a more uh, generic and more, you, you write stuff once and then you can use it in different contexts. That's the whole idea, right? So if I don't specify those types, uh, I can use A in a context of integers with uh, you know, infinite precision, or I can use it in a context of where I care about the precision and I only want it to be an int. But the, the value or the functions that I'm operating on them can be polymorphic. Anyway, so if I do this, and if I do this um, where we had the fmap, yeah. So we had the fmap of um, applying kind of a unary function on top of the of the value. I, I see that I didn't modify the structure. It still is the same structure. It's either some sort of number, but the value got changed, right? Um, what happens if I have a left side, right? So what happens if I have A, which is of type um, either string or int, and I don't have the right side, I have the left side. So what if I have a left side and the left side says, ah, uh, there was some error, right? Uh, and then what if I apply fmap to that? To that, what should happen? Well, applying a function on the functor always gives back the functor, right? So applying a function, normal function on a functor always gives the functor back. And now depending on the functor, the behavior, the, the particular behavior happens. So in the either case, um, if I have left side and right side and I apply a function to either and the, um, the left side is filled in and I'm not using the right side, then the left side is returned. It, it kind of works like an identity element. It will always return the left side. But if the right side is uh, filled in, it will try to apply the function to the right side. So if I have an A, which is not, not either string int, but either string string, right? Um, and I apply multiplication on a string, which doesn't work, right? I, you cannot multiply by 100 a string. The compiler says, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You're doing something fishy here because you're trying to apply a function, a binary, uh, a uni unary function to a type which this unary function doesn't work with. It only works with the with ints, right? So, you know, you cannot do that. Um, so I have to have the second thing, a number or um, or, you know, some kind of concrete type like int for this to even start working. And the funny thing is for A, you know, I'm not really mo multiplying anything by, by 100 because I don't have the right side. I only have the left side and then it just returns the left side, right? So that returns the left side. If A is a maybe, let, where we had the maybe. So let's say uh, A is nothing but it's a maybe int, right? And now I'm multiplying a by 100 again. What would you expect? What do you ex would you expect from that? Well, you would expect this kind of a fallback value, which is nothing. Like if you try to multiply, you know, null pointer by 100, you're gonna get null pointer back, right? So I'm gonna get nothing back, but this nothing is of type maybe int. Um, so we kind of see that we can apply a function to a structured value, right? Uh, and that's great. But what if I have a structured function with structured value? So I don't have, um, so I have a, which is just 10. And then I have a function, which is just multiply by two. And I would like to apply this function to a. 
right? So let's try that. So if I do this and I say fmap apply this function, but you know, the function is wrapped in a context itself. So the function is not just a function, it is just a function, which is a maybe function, uh, then this doesn't work, right? So I cannot apply a function in a context to a value in the context. I can only apply a normal function to a value in the context. So here comes an applicative. Uh, an applicative is basically a functor which can do this trick, right? Which can do, um, which can which can allow me to apply a function in a context to a value in a context. Okay, so uh, and it defines two functions. It defines a pure function which takes a value and puts it in the context, and then it defines an um, kind of a no name splat or whatever that is uh, operator which allows you to apply. Uh, a function in a context to a value in a context and gives you a value in a context back, right? So if we use this operator, uh, we can basically do this, right? So I have now um, a function in a context and using this operator, I can apply it to a value in a context. And now a value in a context is just 10. And then I have a function in a context and I can apply, apply it to that. And I get again a new value in a context, right? So we had value 10. We have a unary function to work on the values. And then the function itself was in a context. And then we get this back, right? Um, we also have this uh, pure thing. And the pure converts a value. So, you know, pure con converts whatever, whatever A is, into a context. So I can put something in the context, right? So what I can do is I can have uh, pure 10 and then um, 10 is just, just a value, but it's not in the context yet, but I can put it in the context by calling this pure function, right? So then it works exactly the same as before. Uh, but before I, I had A already in the context, now I kind of put it in the context by this pure function. Um, all right, so one more test. I think the, yeah, an applicative functor is basically an ability to apply functors to functors, right? We had functor was something that can apply function over. Applicative functor is you can apply functors to functors, right? Um, so one more test. I hope it's the last one. Yes, the last one. So, that should be obvious because we just did that. <laughs> so, so how would you, uh, I will hide it. Uh, how would you apply a function in a context to a value in the context? Um, so plus 10 is a unary function which takes one element and it can operate on numbers and just one is a number in a context. And now we want to apply this to this. Yeah, it's straightforward. You just um, use uh, kind of, uh, you, you have correct answers here. I don't know why the uh, computer thinks that all, all those answers are incorrect. Uh, those answers are correct. Uh, the, I mean, the, the one with the splat, not the one with the plus. So that's probably a typo. Uh, yes, you can use splat in, to, to, to join it, right? So there are different names for this operator. Um, and you, you effectively do it this way, right? Uh, I mean, the, this uh, just, just way. I don't think you need the, bra the braces. Uh, you need the braces here for the uh, making the multiplication. Uh, yeah, let's try it. Yes, you cannot do that this way, but you should be fine this way. Yeah, so you don't need the kind of the outside brackets to isolate the right hand side from left hand side. And note also that this operator is a infix operator. So some operators are like fmap. Uh, so fmap is a prefix operator, like 
this the name of the function and then the arguments follow. But infix operators you can kind of put in between left and right hand side. Uh, so fmap is also a binary function. It takes two arguments: the function, uh, the function f and the value v. Uh, the splat is also a binary operation. It takes a left hand side and right hand side. Pure is a unary operator which takes only one value and then puts it into a context. Pure, right? Um, all right, so what's left? Uh, we have a leaderboard. Yeah, nice. So there are some reshuffling of the of the leaderboard and Mr. Stupid won. Like it's not so stupid after all, right? Um, great, congratulations. And <laughs> We managed 10 o'clock and we managed to get to my final slide and Menti. So we just right on time. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I hope you got the idea about the functors and about the applicatives. Um, and you got kind of the intuition of what this magic effect, magic context is. Uh, it's kind of additional thing which are carried with the values. So like, you know, an int is just an int. It, it doesn't carry additional con context but maybe int or either something int carries additional things with it, like uh, maybe some error code or maybe nothing, which means there was some sort of a fallback to nothingness. Uh, so we kind of started talking about this kind of effectful computations and functions returning values with this kind of additional effect. I mean, you know, a function which returns maybe ints, right? So if I have a function fun, and it takes uh, it takes anything and returns a maybe int. It it is a pure function for given a. It will always return the same maybe int. But we are carrying a little bit of a state here. We it, it, you know you get the intuition that this is a different function to this. This function cannot express an error. It cannot express that something went wrong and we we got nothingness. But this function can right. Uh, both are pure functions. Bureau will always produce the same outcome, but this function has more power. It has additional thing that it can, can re, uh, report, right? Uh, this one cannot. If this one has this kind of erroneous situation, it, it has to blow up. It has to throw an exception or stop the program or whatever, right? If we dividing, like, you know, if, if, if fun divides by zero, then, uh, you know, you cannot get int back. Uh, but here you can, right? Um, here you can get something back which tells you that something went wrong and you get nothing back, right? Uh, so that's the intuition that we need today. And then on Thursday, we continue with this and we kind of expand this notion of effects and how can we deal with them. Um, uh, so do you still need uh, multiplicate uh, the splat operator? So the question is here, um, like, okay, if, if I have two normal, fun two normal values without a any contexts, I don't need anything. I don't need any operators. Th that just works. Uh, like, you know, a space is a function application operator in Haskell and that just works. But if one of them is in a context, um, so if I have uh, this one in the context, then I cannot apply this one to 10 on its own because it's not compatible. The types are not compatible, right? It, it will not work. I have to make the types match. And to make the types match, I have to use the splat operator and then it will not match because the splat operator, like if you ask what is the type of the splat operator, it will tell you that well, it takes a function, unary functions from A to B, which is my first uh, left-hand side. That's my ar first argument. And then on the right-hand side, it takes a value in a context F. And the context F needs to be an applicative context. So it cannot take A, it has to take F of A, right? Which means 10 needs to be in the applicative context, which means to do that, I have to put 10 into an uh, applicative context. So th uh, that's why I need the pure, right? To, uh, I don't need the brackets. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I will see you guys um, on Thursday and we will continue with this.
Thank you.